the, the net result of this uh, rules-based system is that we now have rules which link footprint detail, carbon footprint detail, to financial accounts. This creates an analytic framework. It links financial metrics to carbon metrics, and we'll show the power of that in a few moments. It provides a very strong audit trail in that every rule uh, can be replicated and clearly identified and tested through uh, standard audit practices. And last of all, the financial statements establish what I like to refer to as a trigger mechanism. It, it doesn't directly determine the carbon footprint, but you know, FASB is the best we've got, and it is a periodic system, and so when we trigger a general ledger trial balance or a profit and loss statement, we also, um, that mechanism triggers now a carbon footprint report quickly and consistently and allows us to look at the changes from a very strong and consistent baseline. So let's begin by looking at a case study. And here, what, I'm what I'd like to do is we're going to be looking at sample output the specific data that we're showing in this case uh, to protect uh, privacy with the client has been has been modified, but the uh, the numbers map back uh, nicely to the uh, to the real case um, from a from a generic perspective. The first thing that ECA does is generate a report that's familiar. We find that this is very important for executives. Uh, this particular report is not exactly parallel to a profit loss report, though very often our initial report looks just like one. But here is a very understandable report where we're looking at materials manufacturing and operations. Uh, very often this is mapped to the P&L. So for example, down here the marketing department generates a small carbon footprint. Um, the leadership team uh, certainly recognizes that that can be tied directly to a cost and goals assigned. However, um, this format uh, is not necessarily constructed. That is an organizational format for beginning to understand and map, uh, map actions to your carbon footprint. So the next level down is, is we typically look at scope one, two, and three, which I defined earlier. And here we see in this case that, in fact, scope three is where the strategic attention uh, should be applied. It's about 75% of the total of the total carbon footprint. Then to move on to look at what analytics are actionable and flexible, we probably want to look deeper into the uh, bill of materials and into the financials to determine what specific uh, materials are the major contributors to the carbon footprint. In this case, it was steel, plastic, uh, electricity use, freight, and paper across the organization. Um, but again, organizations are not accustomed to directly managing, for example, steel coming in the door. So we may want to take a deeper cut and look at uh, the product level carbon footprint. And the reporting structure allows us uh, to not only look at, for example, model A, B, C, as we see here, but drill down into those models and understand how much uh, of that product is based on steel, and then begin to consider uh, whether uh, we want to begin working with suppliers, whether we want to look at redesigns or uh, potentially uh, remanufacturing or, or alternative suppliers in each, uh, in each of the product areas. So that's a carbon view of the reports we do. The last section of the presentation, I'd like to say, let's get hip. Um, in deference to, to our partner, and look at the possibility and the power specifically of measuring and of when we begin to merge financial indicators with carbon metrics. So let's begin by looking at a share chart. Um, those of you who are financially oriented would probably uh, find this to be somewhat familiar. We've got a share of revenue by product. We've got a share of profit. And oh, interestingly, now we've added a share of CO2. Um, and I'd like you to follow a certain number of these products. If we look at the Model C up here, we see that it's a low revenue share, a relatively high profit share, but a very high uh, carbon contributor. 
So we might say in sort of classic speak, product speak that C might be a, a candidate as being called one of our dogs. Um, if we look here at um, model D, we have reasonable revenue production, very nice product profit contribution, and very low carbon. So that might be a star product. And looking down here, uh, model B is our big revenue generator. So maybe it's sort of a cash cow with reasonable CO2. Um, let's, if we wanted to drill down a little bit deeper or take a different cut, we might want to look at the profitability of these products. So what's our star product? Uh, model D here in the middle, um, here we go, has a, we're currently reporting a 10% margin on this product. Let's say we conservatively price carbon at $14 a ton, the current euro exchange value. Um, what would that do to the profitability of that product? Well, it would drive it down about 1%, so about 10% to 9%, not bad, but 1% is certainly meaningful. Um, what about our dog over here, Model C? Well, we're at very nice margins today, but with a price of carbon of 14, we've dropped that margin pretty dramatically. So that might be a product we need to, to spend some serious attention with. And last of all, what about our cash cow? Well, it's low profit, as a cash cow might be, but with a 1% reduction and only a 3% margin, it's actually uh, maybe a little bit of a dog character when we cut it uh, from this perspective. Now let's get, um, let's, let's go a little bit deeper. This is a really hip chart. Wide means lots of revenue, and low means very small share of CO2, a consumption as a percent, as a share of revenue. So down into the left, our Model B now is looking pretty good. It's a big revenue producer and a low carbon consumer. Our Model D is lower revenue, somewhat higher revenue, and our dog is way up here. Narrow, small revenue contribution, contribution and huge uh, carbon consumption. Again, we're holding carbon at $14 a ton. But Paul talked about, well, maybe maybe there's uh, some real upside in the, in the price of carbon. What happens if carbon goes to $45? We now have some very interesting new perspective on, on products and looking at, at them in terms of asset and liability value. Well, our, mod, our, our Model B, which had low margins, looks like it has some very high asset value because of its low carbon consumption. We have some significant asset value potentially in the carbon markets for our Model B. Our Model C is still a dog and has some liability, clearly indicating that strategically we ought to be looking at this product. Considering this overall at a company or corporate perspective, the company's maybe not in such bad shape. Clearly this the area of danger above the line is smaller than the area below the line, but you do have uh, some, assets, some, some significant uh, strategic considerations that could uh, dramatically Im uh, impact share price and shareholder value if we don't manage our carbon more effectively. So what has this case um, showed us? Well, number one, we've established a well-structured management process. The carbon integration, or the, the greenhouse gas uh, Accounting is well integrated with periodic financial reporting, and we've demonstrated that there's some very interesting strategic metrics associated with that. Uh, we have a very quantitative basis for strengthened market and brand uh, leadership position. We've targeted areas for cost and carbon reduction. We didn't drill down deeply, but uh, the model allows easily drilling down into, for example, that question I asked earlier. Um, you know, how relevant is an investment in efficient transportation and what would be the return on carbon for such an investment. Um, and it certainly creates a strategic opportunity to manage carbon, both uh, manage your margin risk, uh, manage your balance sheet risk, and hopefully turn that risk into opportunity. So thank you very much.